everybody. Hi. Hi. <laughs> Let's get started, isn't it? All right, yes. good guys. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. We are so happy that you are here with us. And uh, of course, not to your surprise, but we have some amazing leaders also with us. And uh, as you know, this whole conversation, this whole panel is all about what's changing with this new Scrum Guide and how this is impacting us. And uh, when we talk about all of this, we actually invite five experts who have been in and out, who have been consulting, coaching, and training in Scrum and Agile. So these amazing people who are with us are Frank Berber from Netherlands, Dam from Thailand, Arundhati from India, and Yulin from Taiwan, and Ethensu from Indonesia, Malaysia. And we also have one very special guest from Japan, and uh, I'm sure Rachel is very excited to share about uh, who is our special guest, but we'll hold on that for a second. And, yes. Uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Be before that, we'll set some ground rules. And then, you know, Rachel, it is all yours to share what's happening from the Japan end and who is this special guest. Yep. Uh, the, ground, the ground rules are that everyone is muted. So don't freak out in case you don't feel that you are heard. You will be seen. How you will be seen? You put on your messages in chat and someone from the team will respond to you. Also, your questions will be addressed in the Q&A session. Uh, for your friends who are not here, this session is recorded, so don't worry. But you dare not to step away from your screen. You be here in the live sessions. And uh, this session will also be simultaneously broadcasted to CI Agile Facebook and also on the Billy Billy. But for those who are viewing it live, please expect a delay of around 10 to 15 seconds. And uh, yeah, rest everything will be the same. We assure you, you will not miss out on anything. Also, uh, so this whole conversation will go on from 9 p.m., uh, uh, you know, GMT plus 8, which is your Malaysia time, and it will go on for another one hour and 40 minutes. And then the uh, floor will be open for questions and answers. So don't freak out if you don't immediately get response, but don't hesitate and don't stop yourself from putting your questions in the chat box. Do that. So those were some of the ground rules. And uh, if you have any questions, as I already said, I just, that's very important and I'm repeating, you can put those questions in the chat box. So I think that is, you know, all uh, from ground rule setting and everything. I think before we get started, over to you, Rachel, for your special guest and the video from Japan is coming. Yes, yeah, sure. Hello, everyone. By the way, this is Rachel. And uh, just to PM you guys, this event is brought to you by CI Agile as well as Agile Education powered by Scrum Inc. So without further ado, let me share with you guys a video from Scrum Inc. Japan. <music> What Scrum is all about is how to innovate quickly with a small team building new products. That's where it started. And to do that, you have to deliver in short intervals. Amazon is one of the biggest Scrum companies in the world. They have 3,300 Scrum teams, and they deliver a new feature more than once a second. So Scrum is about how people work best together. And it's, there's an incredible amount of data in the research that small teams, small teams of people, are able to create value faster. So how Scrum can change an organization and you get the entire organization to be agile. This is a fundamental shift to focus not on the internal stuff that we're used to focusing on, these internal silos, to having a whole organization focused on delivering value to the customers. という言い方もできますし、ま、やはり顧客に愛していただける、信頼していただけるというところはやっぱりカスタマーファーストで考え、その意見を何が価値ですかというところから開発何取り組んでいくかを決めていくという手法がま、スクラムそのものでしたので、
It's not magic. It requires discipline and training, and that's what we're trying to do with KDDI in Japan with a joint venture we're creating. まあ我々このジョイントベンチャーが日本のお客様に対してより真のスクラムこれを伝えることによってお客様のビジネスに貢献できる、えー、そしてお客様が世の中の激しい競争環境の中で少しでも働き方仕事の仕方、えー、プロダクトの作り方これを少しでも変えることによって、えー、より競争力の高いそのようなお客様の成果に結びつけられればというふうに期待しています。Scrum is a nice tool for the work style revolution that's going on in Japan. It's actually a solution to the problem because as soon as the government said everybody's going to have to work less, then the company said, well, are we going to make enough money if we work less? Scrum is the solution to that. They should be able to make twice as much money working normal hours that they made working long hours. <laughs> working less, make more. That's a really good way of doing life. <laughs> Wow, that gives goosebumps. That's truly, you know, doing double in the half of the time. Thank you so much, Rachel. And now, before we all get into a serious conversation, I request our panelists to do a quick round of introduction because no matter I calling out their names doesn't do the justice. So I want to get us all started with Frank. Frank, can we know something about you? Yeah, sure. Thank you, Deepthi. So my name is Frank. I'm from the Netherlands. I am a, a Scrum practitioner for some 14 years now. I've been doing a lot of thinking about what drives Scrum, what makes it so effective, and what leads us to have the really good practices and what separates them from the really bad practices. I've been very much focused on the data, and I've、uh, presented an idea、uh, for a paper、uh, to Jeff、uh, some years ago, and we decided to co-write the paper and we published it some、wow. years ago. So that's really nice. That is totally cool. Yeah, thank you. So can I request Arundhati to please introduce herself? Sure. Thanks, Deepthi.、Um, hi, everyone. Excited to be here. I'm Arundhati. I live between San Francisco and、uh, Bangalore in India, and I am a product owner at a startup in Silicon Valley. And I am very passionate about creating high-performing teams. And、uh, I've worked directly with Dr. Sutherland, and I think Scrum really works. And I'm super passionate to bring it to as many teams as possible. So great to be here and see all of you. Thank you. So now I request Ethan Su to introduce himself. Yeah, hi, I'm Ethan.、Um, I work in China for about twelve years and just came back to Malaysia.、Um, I use Scrum since zero three, so that's been like seventeen years ago. I'm glad to be here. Glad to be joining you guys. Thank you so much, Ethan. Hi, Andrew. Can you please introduce yourself? Sure. Thanks, Deepthi, and happy to be here to share my experience of Scrum with everybody. Um, I help team and organization to deliver twice the value in half the time. Good to be here. Thank you. Thank you. Great to have you here. And so now we have Dam. Dam, can you please introduce yourself? Hi, everyone. I'm a human from Thailand. <laughs> <laughs> I'm with a human now. We are I, great.、Uh, yeah, I live in the U.S. and I met Jeff Sutherland in 2018. I was his co-trainer in Boston at, last year, and after traveling around the world in 30 days, I learned a lot from many people. And I like support. I like supporting other people to create values and happiness at work and at home. Thank you. You know, Dam, it is so amazing to hear that in such a competent, you know, cutthroat competition environment, and、uh, it is really wonderful、uh, to see you holding that spirit. Thank you. And so now this is the time to talk about this very special guest, Kesuke, who is from Japan. And Kesuke, we want to hear from you. What do you want to introduce about yourself to us? The first. I would like to thank、uh, Lejo and Ethan for inviting me to this great event. I'm Keisuke、uh, from Scrum Inc. Japan. Scrum Inc. Japan is a Japanese subsidiary of Scrum Inc. We support、uh, Japanese national flag companies like Toyota and Lexus、uh, to achieve their other transformation. I'm very excited to be here and become a part of a great Scrum community in Asia. Thank you. We are so happy to have you here, Kesuke. 
Yeah, thank you so much, Kesuki. All right, guys. So, should we jump into the panel on the awesome discussions which are planned? Yes. Okay. So, as we get started, I have seen Arundhati and Frank, you know, talking a lot and getting uh, into deep dives about what has changed with this new Scrum Guide and why those changes were made. So, can I invite them and share their insights? Absolutely. You, Let me. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes. Super excited to be here today to talk about the changes. Uh, Frank and I have been having a lot of conversations around this, uh, as have all the panelists. We've been working together as a team. Uh, but first, thank you, Deepthi. I want to give a big shout out to you for being our host today. I'm always inspired by your community contributions and all the work that you do to spread Agile. So thank you. So with that, mm -hmm. let's um, let's jump right in and talk about the changes in the Scrum Guide 2020. So first, the Scrum Guide was an already great product, and it just got a product increment, which I think makes it the best Scrum Guide ever. So when Frank and I were looking at the changes, uh, we started to categorize them into three main themes, and uh, we'll walk you through each one. And then Frank, uh, Ethan, Dom, and um, um, others will also walk you through some of the other changes. So with that, let's jump into the main themes. So the three themes are the first uh, we think is one team. And Frank, do you want to go ahead and tell us more about that? Yeah, thanks, Arundhati. Indeed, the new Scrum Guide stresses that there is one team consisting of the product owner, the Scrum Master, and the developers. Scrum teams have, in practice, too often seen a divide between the product owner and the developers, creating a sort of team within a team. And way too often, the product owner and Scrum Master were even seen as external to the team. With the new Scrum Guide, we've moved language uh, that stresses that there is only one team because there should not be a team within a team. The product owner should not be a kind of a project manager and the developers are no longer referred to as a development team. Everybody is trying to work together to achieve the same goal. We're striving to achieve the same goal together and that is much healthier than having the developers be a separate group where sometimes you would see that the product owner could get angry at the developers. Instead now, we have effectively changed something about doing uh, the way that we do a team so that we execute good Scrum. And this new language helps eliminate a lot of misunderstandings that lead to bad Scrum. Now, by being one team, there is a shared responsibility for success, shared by everyone, including the product owner, the Scrum master, and the developers. If the sprint fails, everybody fails. The reason for this is very clear. We want everyone focused on the same goal, Clear focus on a shared goal makes teams more productive and increases the chance of success for the entire team. This also means that cross-functionality can now take on a shape not previously implied by the Scrum team, where Scrum Master and Product Owner can also be a part of the group of developers, either as a bonus or as a structural part. More on that comes in the next section on accountability. Arundhati. Can you tell us how this new version of the Scrum Guide has changed the way we think about the product owner and Scrum Master as accountabilities? Yeah, absolutely, Frank. Uh, so in the Scrum Guide 2020, the product owner, the Scrum Master and developer are no longer roles. They are accountabilities. In fact, if you look at the Scrum Guide 2020, you will find that there is no mention of the word role. So let's try to understand what that means. So, like Frank just mentioned, the word accountability now implies that these are more of responsibilities and obligations than formal roles. Meaning that if I believe I can fulfill the accountabilities, for example, for both uh, Scrum Master and Developer, then sure, um, there is no reason why I can't be both the Scrum Master and the developer. And I have actually seen this play out in multiple very high-performing teams. 
Um, it also promotes a greater sense of ownership because really the buck stops with you. You can certainly delegate the work, um, like a product owner might get help with doing some of the product backlog items, they might get help with maybe even some customer interviews, but ultimately they remain accountable. And I think that that teams that were doing good Scrum or true Scrum already understood this, um, that, that the roles were never just roles, they were always meant to be accountabilities. Uh, because what happens when it's just a role or, or a title is that it's kind of like it's given to you, right? You inherit it. So, for example, I join a company as a product owner or scrum master, and that's my role. That's my title. So now I know I have some responsibilities, but the en at the end of the day, if I don't achieve those responsibilities, I'll still have that title. Whereas when, when it's an accountability and I have not fulfilled those accountabilities, then I cannot call myself a product owner or a scrum master. So I think this shift in thinking will really help teams develop that increased sense of responsibility towards their work. It also promotes self-managing because these accountabilities along with the one team concept means that if team members are not able to meet their accountabilities, then other team members need to jump in and help out because it's ultimately just one team. Um, so I think this aligns beautifully with what Dr. Sutherland has been emphasizing to us uh, trainers in the Scrum community many times over that Scrum is all about delivering results and it's about getting stuff done. So, so that's accountability. We also have another awesome change in the Scrum Guide that I think will help teams deliver awesome results, which is the product goal. Frank, do you want to tell us more about that? Yeah, definitely. Thank you. Uh, by the way, very well put on the, on the accountability. Love that. Um, with regards to the product goal, a product goal is, is a new thing. It's a, a thing that we're going to be achieving with our product, for our product, it is a centralized vision of a thing that we want to be striving towards. Now that I mentioned that, I remember that you have a pretty good story on that, Arundhati, don't you? It's a, it's a Google uh, story? Yes, it is. So Frank and I were talking and I was telling him the story. And he said, you should share this story. So here it goes. So the story goes back to a Friday in May of 2002. Larry Page, the co-founder of Google, was testing out Google's search results. So he put in the term Kawasaki H1B and found all sorts of ads for H1B visas. But the Kawasaki H1B has nothing to do with H1B visas. It's a bike model. So he put in a few other terms like French cave painting um, and other terms and found a lot of irrelevant searches showing up. So he printed those out. He walked over to the office kitchen and this is when Google was a much, much smaller company. It was like a startup. Uh, it had far fewer employees than it has now. So he, he goes to the kitchen, he puts it up on the wall, and he wrote on, you know, in caps that these ads suck. So that was Friday. And the following Monday at 5 a.m. in the morning, a Google engineer sends out an email saying that he was in the office that Friday. He had gone into the kitchen. He had seen Larry's printouts. Uh, he had seen the irrelevant search results and ad searches come up. And he agreed. It sucked. So he had gone home and started working on this. And he worked through the weekend and came up with a way to uh, better show search results. And he prototyped it. And he was mailing back with the prototype he had developed over the weekend. Interestingly, this particular engineer was not even on the AdWords team. But because Google had this goal of organizing the world's information, he saw that these bad search results were getting in the way of that goal. And he went and worked on it on his own time. That is the power that can be unlocked when companies focus. Wow, that is inspirational. That is really a great example of the power of focus. Choosing what to do, what to do together, what not to do. It's a great way to take the power of that story and to use it in everyday life is to set a product goal and sort of all swarm around it like a, like a, hi like a hive mind, like a bunch of bees. 
And if you want to make that a little bit more concrete, there is a pattern which is called swarming. And that actually formalizes all buzzing around, around a central theme and trying to finish it before you finish anything else. Swarming is the most important pattern you will ever learn about. And it will increase the performance of your team drastically as you do it. It will help everyone on the team focus on a single goal and work relentlessly on it until they finished it. The product goal helps people understand what that single goal is, and it makes it transparent for everyone to work towards. It is then the sprint goal that commits everyone in the, in the team to achieving the next step to work towards making that product goal a reality. Transparently connecting your everyday work to the overarching theme that we're trying to achieve as an organization. Now, the new Scrum Guide tries to make goals and their transparent connection all the way down to day-to-day -day work a priority. The organization's overarching goals need to transparently tie into the product goal. This is done with three commitments, the product goal, the sprint goal, and the definition of done. Their connection is best represented as the definition of done being the commitment for the increment, the sprint goal being the commitment for the sprint, and the product goal being the commitment of the product backlog, meaning that the entire product backlog is the manifestation of a single product goal. And so now let's move on to the next section of this conversation. And uh, in this conversation, the focus will be more about um, what is the impact on practitioners, the existing as well as new. And uh, for that, uh, I request our uh, Scrum leader, and you Lynn, to talk about. And you, over to you. Thank you, Diti. And then I'm going to talk about two topics here. The uh, first one is how does the Scrum Guide 2020 impact you? I'll use one example. Um, the next topic will be how can Scrum do for you? Uh, I'm going to share a personal story with everybody. So for existing practitioners, one thing that you will notice in the Scrum Guide 2020 is that it's no longer listed the three questions for daily Scrum. But by the way, the, the three questions are actually optional in 2017 version. But now it's totally gone. Uh, for me, it's always to understand something uh, that I, you know, that, that, that confusing me and about this daily scrum is I like to look at where does it come from. So daily scrum is based on the research done by the Bell Lab for Borden. Uh, Borden is a software company in the 80s for their product called Quattro Pro Windows. It's a spreadsheet software. And the software actually dominated the market before the Microsoft Excel. One thing they find out is that the high performing teams were driven by daily meeting. That high performing team had frequent meetings, almost daily. And then based on the discussion from the daily meeting, the team will make changes and they will integrate and test it before the next meeting, and which usually is the next day. And that's where the daily scrum comes from. Now, by the way, there are also other couple of things that's being observed in that research. The one is called fewer roles. So if you put these two together, daily meeting with fewer roles will give you high velocities. Now, about the daily scrum. So it's like a huddle in the football game. It's about close collaborations. The team get together. So what are they doing get together? So they get together for discussion and make it clear the progress toward the sprint. How are we, the we mean the team, going to meet the sprint goal? And the daily scrum also produce an actionable plan for the next day. This creates focus. Now focus is one of the scrum values. That, so the focus means that is a story on the board that we're going to work on and improve the self-managing like Frank and Arundhati mentioned. The team solve the challenging by themselves. And it's also about uh, identify the impediment and fix it. Now, now, by the way, I always say, don't wait for the daily scrum to bring your impediments. When you have an impediment, you say it right there, right? And it's just like software bug. When do you fix the bug? as soon as you see it, right? And actually that is one of the pattern too. Uh, 
and the daily scrum is to promote quick decision making. This is critical to your project success. If the decision takes longer than five hours, the project success rate is only 18%. If it's less than an hour, it's 58%. So make quick decision will increase your project success rate. And it's also about adapt or replan the rest of your sprint work. So again, it's to focus on the most important story and get it done. One thing that I always see from my team is that after the daily scrum, the team will swarm together. So just like Frank and I already mentioned about swarming, the team work together to deliver the feature the customer want and the product the customer love. Now I have a story to share. I have worked with a team that we were addressing a website reliability challenge. Uh, this team has more than one daily scrum. There's always one in the morning. Uh, again, it's about collaboration and swarming. So they identify the, the challenge together. For example, oh, I'm seeing a very slow query in this code here. Uh, I'm seeing several errors here. They solve the problem together and improve the next one. The team was all working on their own office. Okay, that's the office they are. And as soon as some discussion going on in the Slack channel, that somebody will say, space, please. Now, the, the space, the team has an open area with all the whiteboard, you know, snack and drink, which is very important. Uh, big screen TV with all the side monitoring too. And they call this area collaboration space. They would stand in together, discuss that, come up with a solution and do it, and come back to verify and focus on the next one. So that's the daily scrum for the existing practitioner. And this is the data that we just mentioned, is the decision latency impact on the project success. Now you can see here, if it's less than an hour, your success rate is 58%. It's longer than five hours, then it's dropped to 18%. Now, if you are a new practitioner, congratulations, okay? Start with the right training and then really keep it going with a good coach and you will be able to deliver at least twice the value in half the time. And you don't need to unlearn the best ground that you learned. Here is another story. I was running an experiment with one team in December 2013. I was trying to figure out just how fast the team performed before and after scrum. And it was more than 400%. Uh, more than Actually, it was close to 800 or 900%. Now, a lot of people, a lot of trainers look at their case study, thanks to Aaron Dati, and then they ask me, like, what's the magic? And to be honest, there is no magic. It's just do good scrum, or it's just say it's true scrum. Uh, you will get at least 400% increase in velocity, and I'm pretty sure your team can do better. I think this version of the Scrum Guide is back to the root of Scrum. It's almost like Bruce Lee says, no style. Uh, it's less prescriptive, but you really need a good trainer, coach, and mentor to help you. So it does not matter if you are existing or you are new to Scrum. When you get your hands dirty and you start doing it, you will have many questions and you will find your own way of doing Scrum, which is probably not correct. So please, let's not pick and choose. Now, what can Scrum do for you? I, I, I love to tell stories. So I want to share another story of what Scrum did to me. And you can be the judge. And hopefully, it will inspire you and you don't make the same mistake that I did. So it was December 2002. It was supposed to be Christmas. Actually, around the same time that we, we have right now. And I was sitting in an arbitration. Now, at the days of fighting in an arbitration, it was a terrible experience. I still remember how humiliated the way that the other attorney asked me all the questions. And it took a couple of months and it was finally over, and I asked myself this question. Why did I fail? It does not make sense. 
There was nothing wrong with what I was doing, right? It was a large enterprise resource planning implementation. Um, we had a perfect plan. Okay, we mean actually I, I had a perfect plan. I personally spent weeks writing all the requirements in detail upfront. And you know, trying to capture everything. Now, every time I hear everything, so here's something about everything. If you don't put your requirement in there, they will not be implemented. It's not a question that we need it or not. It's more like a question of we want everything just in case we need it one day. Now, the developer took months building it one stage by another stage from requirement, design, coding, testing, and go back to coding and then more testing. It was a perfect waterfall. And that's how you do project, right? The truth is, at the month, you either find out nothing works like you plan it, or if you're lucky, you deliver something, but here is a sentence that nobody wants to hear at the end of it. That's not what I want. And I end up in arbitration. So I started to look at for other ways to do projects. There were actually several uh, methodologies out there at the time. There was IBM Regional Unified Process. Oracle has something called um, uh, uh, application implementation methodologies. I'm pretty sure I still have the CD somewhere. I feel like I need a PhD degree to understand all that. Until one day, one day, my brother called me and said, hey, Andrew, look at something called Scrum. And I'm like, what? Can, can you spell that for me? So that was the year 2005 or six. That's where my Scrum journey started. And then I worked for many teams, many products. When we deliver, we deliver what customers love. One of the products that I work on recently, our customers including major US government, uh, Fortune 500 companies. Every time we show them a new feature, it usually goes like this. Wow, that's really the great features. And then we ask them for feedback, right? And then they will say something like, you know, Andrew, if you could add this, it will be perfect. And you know what? Two weeks later, boom, dreams come true. The feature is there. So is Scrum still nice to have? Ten years ago, maybe, but not for now and future. Is waterfall still an option? No, I really don't want everybody to fail like me 17 years ago and end up in arbitration. Remember, there are rocks at the bottom of waterfall and they will hurt you. And be mindful, you really need to do, um, don't pick and choose your scrum. If you pick and choose, you probably get 10, 20% of increase in performance, but that's not scrum. And scrum will help you and your team to deliver to deliver the product that your customer love. And I love this from the Jeff uh, video. Jeff said in the Scrum Guide 2020 video, in the COVID time, their company stock has exploded. And these are more agile Scrum companies. There are also thousands of less agile companies that go in chapter 11. That makes all of you, all of us, doing Scrum critical to the survival of your organization. Your company depends on you to stay alive. No one should be in the court or arbitration arguing failed project like I did before. And that's how Scrum did for me. And I would love to hear your story soon too. Thank you. Thanks a lot, Andrew. Lovely story. You can actually see in the comments, people are loving it. Thanks so much so authentically sharing. And so now this reminds me another story, which Rachel was very excited when we were talking to share. And this is a story from Japan, how Scrum has helped Japan and the organizations there. So Rachel, can you play this video for us where we have the story? I know that's in the native Japan language, but there are subtitles and we can understand that. Japan. 70年代、80年代の高度経済成長期以降 
スクラムインクジャパンは日本の働く人々と企業が再び活力を取り戻すことを目的に設立されました日本をはじめアジアの多くの国では階層型でコマンドコントロールの組織が多いですこうした組織においてチームレベルでスクラムを実践しようとしても従来型の意思決定プロセスや組織の壁が障害となりスクラムチームはアジャイルな働き方を実践することはできません私たちはスクラムを導入する企業にはまずリーダーシップからスクラムをもっと始めることを求めますそして次にリーダーシップのスクラムチームとパイロットチームが新たな自立分散型の組織モデルであるスクラムアットスケールの運営を開始することを支援しますスクラムアットスケールが軌道に乗ると多くのウォーターホールのプロジェクトチームが自らの意思でスクラムにスクラムを実践するようになりますスクラムチームはこれまでのウォーターホールのプロジェクトチームより生産性が高く早く価値を届けそして何よりも楽しいからです IT 組織でうまくいくと勢いがつきますそうするとマーケティングや人事といった他の部門からも新たなスクラム組織に参画するようになりますスクラムインクジャパンはこのようにして日本企業の全社的なアジャイル変革の実現を支援しています実際に日本でもトヨタリクシルといった我々のお客様においてこうした組織的なスクラムの採用が始まりましたトヨタの自動運転ソフトウェアの子会社では 100% スクラムですリクシルの IT 部門はすでに300人近いメンバーがスクラムで働くようになりマーケティング部門もスクラムで働くようになりました一日にして全てを変えることはできませんがスクラムアジャイルの普及を通じてスクラムインクジャパンは日本企業の変革を実現していきますまた日本の抱える課題はアジア全体が抱えるまたは今後抱える問題だと思いますここに集まったスクラムインクトレーナーとコミュニティの皆さんと協力し合うことでアジア全体の企業文化の,文化の変革にも貢献したいと思っています。In terms of culture and mindset for the organizations. So over to you, Ethan and Dao. Hi, we arrived at the、uh, section where we talk about the impact to implementation in Asia to you and to your work. So、um, I think Cascade has a great video, and、uh, we can see clearly that if we were to implement Scrum Skill,、uh, it would really help the organization to adopt Scrum better. Okay, so let's move to、uh, the next page. So, what does it mean to you?、Uh, so, if we look at the Scrum Guide 2020 updates, there's really one thing, one message we really want to send to you、uh, that is for all the agile listeners in Asia start thinking about how to use Scrum Guide, how to use Scrum and the new Scrum 2020 Scrum Guide to help you shift into a high performance work culture.、Um, it's not about just doing the work. It's like, In Asia, a lot of people just go to work every single day、uh, with Scrum. So they will go to work and they will go to daily stand up and answer the three questions. And that's it. Then go back to work and do whatever things they want.、Um, we hope you will get a message that with this update of the Scrum Guide, we really want you to think about how you can leverage it to build a high performance work culture.、Um, Don, you want to、uh, add something to it? Yeah, sure. I can give you an example. During Bangkok was locked down from the COVID 19 in April and May,、uh, I volunteer with many engineers, doctors, nurses, and business analysts to create an app called Care to help Thai people to quarantine at home happily and safely. So we have、uh, many, in- we produce many increments、yeah, to make sure that Thai people understand what. COVID 19 is,、uh, what symptoms are, and how to wash their hands, and even like how to connect to doctors or nurses before going to a hospital. And our outcome is really simple. We just wanted to save 
only one life. That's that's what we wanted to do for our country. You know, happily, actually, we can help many Thai people to be safe at home and to be happy at home. That's what we do for our what we did for our increments and our product outcome from the app c o l Care. Yeah, for all the agilists, um, please get this. It's not about delivering the increments. There are there are Scrum team members that told me that hey, uh, since we use uh, whatever agile practice, we are able to deliver five increment in a single sprint, um, or ten increment, or one thousand increment, or something like that. It's, it's not about increment. It's about producing the work outcome, happy customers, great product, uh, things that your customer like. With the least amount of work, with the least amount of increment, perhaps, right? So focus on generating the work outcome and and make your companies help your company to be successful. And that's the one important key uh, key message we want to give you. And the second point, uh, to do that, uh, you you try not to just follow the rules. Now in Asia, a lot of Uh, agile practitioner is custom to just follow the rules. So there was this Scrum team uh, that told me, "Hey, we can't find a place to do our daily Scrum meetings." I said, "Hey, what about the uh, the the meeting room that's locked uh, just next to your workspace? Can you do that?" And they they told me uh, it t- it would take about three months for us to to get an approval to unlock that room and use it, if we can get it. So. <laughs> So, in order to for you to be successful, uh, you have to do something about it. And we are so used to be just listening to to the boss, following the rule, come to work just like this. Uh, here, we want to pass you a message that you should try to create a sustainable, happy work environment that help you to produce the outcome. And you should uh, take the step to change things. Okay. Yeah. I have the Scrum Guide 2020 uh, with me here. I'm gonna read some sentences from Scrum definition. Scrum is built upon the collective intelligence of the people using it. Rather than provide people with detailed instruction, the rules of Scrum guide their relationships and interactions. So, we might, <laughs> we should be intelligent how to apply, yeah, many things in the Scrum guide. To make sure that we work effectively, Jeff, yeah. I would like to say I'm sorry that I did daily scrum in California 20 minutes. <laughs> That's why many people said like, "Oh, are you doing uh, California and Ajaya, huh?" Right. So we spend five minutes to update our life, to chit chat that uh, create a relationship bonds between among team members, and then we were happy to work together. And then we created values for our company. So once you know um, that you you will focus on the work outcome, and you will take the step to uh, to um, go forward to change some of the rules, uh, how to create a sustainable work environment. Um, The next thing you should think about is that hmm, Scrum is not just a minimum framework. Allow, well, we are told that Scrum is a minimum framework, right? But then that's the that's the term called shuhari. Um, when you don't know uh, what you're doing, you're a beginner. You're just a starter, right? Just do uh, whatever that's defined the Scrum guide. Now, with some experience, um, you can try to add something to it. You can try to change some of the tune it, right, to make it more effective in your work environment. With that said, uh, what what I hope to do is to get this to show you that you are able to do something about it. You are able to make some changes. You are able to make some alteration in in terms of how you use Scrum, right? But think seriously before adding any element elements of your old process into it, because a lot of people, when you open up that shuhari thought to to people, they 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 would change it on day one and make it re 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 instead of shuhari. Right, so think seriously before you add any any elements from old processes. It's about configuring your Scrum to 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 produce optimal performance, so that you can be successful, so that you can be uh, uh, in a high performance culture. You know what? Last year I didn't stand Shuhari, and that's why I study Aikido in Thailand in Bangkok. And my master told me like. 
hey Dom, you have to unlearn and relearn something new. Yeah, don't put anything like you got it in the past with the class. And I felt like that's why in our Scrum in Scrum Master, yeah, taught us about value stream mapping. It's really useful for understand the whole process, and then we can find uh, root causes and actions to make to to make uh, our teams to be more effective. And next year, I would like to introduce demo design and design methodology. Sorry, design and engineering methodology for organizations is kind of like beyond value stream mapping. Are you excited for that? I'm really happy to share with you all. So as a summary to this page, before we move on, um, for all the agilists in Asia with this new Scrum Guide update, right? Let's think about how, how do we make use of it to shift into a high performance culture? Think about producing the work outcome. Don't just come come to work every single day trying to just to finish a project, crank out as much code as possible, do stuff like that. It's not about the increment, it's about the outcome, right? And you should try to do it with the least amount of increment if it's possible, that will give you the best value, right? Don't just follow, follow the rules, step forward, see what you can change. You want to create a sustainable, happy work environment so that you can keep producing work outcomes. And Scrum is not just about the minimum frameworks. Uh, you are empowered to, to, to add things to it, right? To make some fine tuning of it okay? when you're experienced enough. All right, let's move on to the, to the next, to next topic, which are the essential skills. So with all these changes, with the move to, uh, to, to high performance culture and, and all this product or whatever. So we, me and Dom have two topics that we want to talk to you about, about essential skill. Okay, let's, let's move forward to the next page. The first topic, uh, the first topic that we we'll, we'll like to talk to you about is about self-organizing to self-managing. Uh, that is a topic of a lot of debate. A lot of people will just look at the term self-managing and 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 what does and and trying to figure out what does it mean. Okay, so self-organizing is actually it's a term from complex adaptive system, where people self-organize to achieve a goal. It's important achieve a goal. Now, when a lot of people look at the self-organizing term and with their own understanding, a lot of people thought that self-organizing means I can do whatever I want, however I want it. So uh, the self-organizing become no, not organized at all. So Dr. Jeff actually changed uh, the, 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 the language so that we can understand this part easier. He wants us to self-manage to achieve a goal. And that's really, really important. Now, with this, the, uh, we, we would like to highlight three important threats for you, uh, for you to have uh, to be successful in this. Yeah, you know what? <laughs> Why well, I ask you if you are human? I realize that I'm a human. I'm dying. I will live in this world until 120 years old. That's why time is really important for me. I am I'm an on-time person. I don't want to waste other people's time. Yeah, that's why to work uh, with the Scrum framework, you need to be on time. Yeah, especially for their Scrum. And then you can finish it quickly and then you will know everything, uh, what you need to fix, not what you need to work on for each day. And then you can create values. Yeah, if your leadership team empowers you to, to, to self-manage, right? If you are not disciplined, uh, you don't come to work on time. You don't, you don't uh, uh, respect your own commitment, right? You don't honor your commitment. You do whatever you want. Sooner or later, you'll find that your leadership team will look at the results and lose trust on, lose trust on you, right? So, uh, so your ability to self-manage may be retracted. They will say, okay. We give you, we empower you to do this. We, we allow you to try to self-manage and you're not disappointed. We don't see you move, uh, you progress as a team. We only see that you're doing whatever you like and whatever you want, right? So, so, so discipline is actually the first thing that we want to highlight to you for you to be successful in self-managing. The second threat that I want to highlight to you is that courage, right? You should be brave. Uh, you should do things uh, you should do the right things, even if they look scary to you, like to influence your boss, to make certain decision, to do it the agile way, to uh, to change some of the old process, to 
unlock the 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 meeting room door to commit to something new to change old habit and things like that so if if you are not able to to be to be courageous to make decision and take responsibility out of it it's very hard for you to produce the result of a self managing team yeah it's like unlock yourself <laughs> yeah to change your old habits you actually everyone knows yeah everyone knows uh, themselves what makes them slow what makes them uh not effective right and then um we should change some behaviors for example in spend retrospective for someone who is really shy to speak up they need to be do something to encourage to motivate themselves to speak their mind yeah tell their team members what they are feeling or uh, what they are thinking about yeah some people cannot do it that's why yeah people cannot work together and at the same time for for people who like speaking they should dare to listen to other people deeply and then uh people who work together can understand to uh each other and then they can walk they can work they can have fun yeah at work i spent about 12 years in china and uh is i know how scary it is to go up to, go up to your boss talk to him and say no or boss please change something like this it's it's so difficult in the, in the chinese culture and certainly in 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 many parts of asia as well right so but we want to highlight this message to you uh, if you want to if you want to be a good team a self managing good team think about this you should have this threat right and the and the last threat we want to highlight to you is about passion a passionate team uh find their way uh, to be successful you can accelerate 100% 200% 400% like jeff talk about if you are passionate you will find you will find your way to do it it's not easy if you are not passionate you will just come to work every single day just like the same you're used to it you are just okay let me just finish my work i go home right if you have a team like that how could you be successful in self managing to achieve a higher goal yeah this is like you are falling in love with someone even though you are busy but you will find your schedule to see that person right when you are only before but only before she becomes your wife <laughs> <laughs> i shouldn't talk about this so when you when you when you are passionate on something yeah you might work too hard and you might work on something that it could be meaningless that's why i really like the scrum guide 2020 yeah when you are when you are in love with something you should find your goal that's for that goal you cannot have only passion but you should have goal or goals <laughs> yeah for yeah doing something otherwise it's going to be meaningless so as a summary to this page um from self organizing to self managing it's just a change of the language to to help you understand better when Je what Jeff and Ken wants uh, in a scrum team it's not about doing uh, whatever you like however you want it's about it's about having this the discipline the courage and the passion to be successful as a very good scrum team uh Dr Jeff actually have a video on on this so uh let's us go to the video and and look at uh, and see what Jeff messages So this section also refer to scrum teams being self managing explain the importance of this to us and how it differs from self organizing the whole idea of self organizing comes from complex adaptive systems theory uh, scrum is based on decades of scientific research i am a professor of mathematics a professor of biometrics a professor of radiology and a professor of epidemiology and i spent decades in universities and everything is scrum was researched in the universities and part of that research was a complex adaptive system is a system that self organizes to achieve a goal 
So when you build a, a autonomous robot, that robot is an intelligent system trying to achieve some goal that you're, and as it moves, it will run into problems. And what it does is it figures out how to solve that problem and, going in a, and go in a different direction. So that self-organization is always part of the drive to achieve a goal. Yeah, I got that story. Now, in, in many scrum teams, in fact, in every company I've been in, I always ask them, do you have any developers who think self-organization means they can do whatever they want? And everybody laughs and they all raise their hand. So in every company, we have people who are completely misinterpreting self-organization. They have no understanding of complex adaptive systems. And so we need to word the Scrum Guide in a way <laughs> that it makes it clearer that they need to self-manage to achieve the sprint goal. I think even a new developer can understand that, right? <laughs> yeah, I heard you talk about California Scrum and self-organizing become no organization at all. Yeah, right. So, Things like that. Right? Yeah. So this could be an extension yeah. to fix that, right? Yeah, right. So yeah. It, it, this this happens every up every time we update the guide. In many ways, Scrum is not different, but we. We say it different so people can understand it better, right? Sometimes we say something like self-organization and people have no idea what that is. So we have to say something maybe simpler. Maybe they can understand self-managing to achieve a sprint goal. Thank you. Thanks, Ethan, and thanks, Dan. Thanks a lot, you know, for bringing a perspective for how culturally it will be different from Asia, from the rest of the world. Of course, the knowledge is same, but our culture, our mindset, our way of being, uh, you know, generations over is very different. Our leadership mindset is very different. So, yeah, it's just harder to be confrontational, I think, uh, in China, in Japan. Try imagining a Japanese worker going to his boss to confront his boss and say no. Yeah. Yeah, I couldn't imagine that. It's very hard yeah. to <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it's much liberated here, but... I totally get the challenge because after all, now we all work with each other's country and we see so much difference in the culture. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. All right. Awesome. So for this, thanks for this wonderful panel. And now there is some time to get answering to the questions. One more topic. Uh, one more topic. One more topic uh, about the Scrum Masters. Yep. Oh, uh, yes. Yes. The, uh, the top is about servant leaders to true leaders. This is another term that's being uh, debated uh, at large uh, everywhere, right? So it, it actually, this is the same. The situation of this is the same as the self-organization to, uh, to, to self-managing, right? It's a language cleanup, right? So uh, the, the word servant uh, in many cultures mean different things. Like you talk about servant in India, uh, it, it means different thing. You talk about a servant in China, it different thing as well it's definitely not the servant of the servant leaders so uh so what we want to do is to have clean up this language now dr jeff talk about the scrum master as a true leaders as leader who serve he, what he wanted is like a soccer captain that can work together with the team uh, they can play the game with the team win or lose or perhaps lead the team to the glory so he's looking for someone like messi or ronaldo Frank Breckenbach, Johann Kraft, those, those kind of people as the true leaders. What he doesn't want is someone like Jose Mourinho, stand, sit by the sidelines and become a coach. I coach you without doing the work, right? That's quite detached from the team. So this is something that a lot of people uh, didn't get the message about when, when, uh, when the word scrum, uh, when the word servant leader is being used. So the language cleanup up become true leaders, leader who serve. Like think about the soccer captain, right? And with this, we, we want to highlight three important threats for you to be successful as a, as a true leader. Yeah, I think I have never told you that I was uh, a soccer agent in Thailand before moving to the US. So I saw many soccer coaches. They were so kind to their team players, like uh, their kids. Again, yeah, I'm a human. Are you a human? If you are a human, I think you love yourself. I love myself too. 
when I see people working together and are suffering from uh, working, from creating things or producing products, I'm not happy. Yeah, I totally believe that I can help them to have better life. Yeah, that's why I really in love yeah, with Scrum Agile because I believe that I can help them to be better. Yeah, I think uh, the panelists, uh, us all, right, uh, have at least several sessions talking about where the compassion is, should be the first threats that we we, uh, that we want to we want to highlight to you, right? So uh, it's been a long after a long consideration. Now, for most of us, uh, if we want to be a good leader, we should we should be compassionate. We should be kind and understand and understanding to other people. Now. Um, Perhaps for 95% of us, that's true. Because if you don't do that, you can't create a, a very, uh, very um, sustainable and happy working environment and have other people uh, working with you comfortably and move forward, right? So, uh, if, of course, if you are Steve Jobs, then you can be a hard ass, a bad ass guy, and you can still be a good, great leader, right? But for most of us, I think for 95% of us, I think it's true to be, to be compassionate. Right, it's important. Uh, the second, the second message we want to highlight to you is about value-driven and result-focused. Now, being a leader, you should have this. Value-driven means select the right thing to do, and result-focused means you should be able to work with your team and lead your team to the finishing line. Right. So uh, this is the important thing. Otherwise, if you don't know how to select the right thing to do and how to do how to go about doing things, then you end up wasting a lot of time. Right. You are doing things that's of no value. If you don't have result focus, you are not delivering. You are not delivering the value. You are not delivering the work outcome. You are just doing whatever you, you, you want to do. You can you can make 10 commitments in a sprint and and don't deliver them at all because you are not result focused. It's really easy to 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 understand this. Uh, what we are talking, Ethan. You just ask yourself: If you die tomorrow, what you want to do? That's why prioritization is very really important. Again, I'm a human. If you are a human, you are dying. I'm dying too. So I cannot finish everything that I need to do. That's why each day I have to prioritize what I need to deliver to my clients or customer and my life. Yeah, that's why this topic is very important for everyone who are working on something. Yeah, and if you are com a compassionate leader and you are and you you know how to deliver, the last thing that we want to highlight to you is that is your ability to synchronize. Now, uh, uh, when I talk when I first talk with Dime, I actually don't understand what this would mean, but after his explanation to me, now I do understand. Uh, Dime, you want to go about it? Yeah, I uh, I invited Jeff Sutherland to my uh, meetup Domina in August, and I asked him like, Jeff, could you please give me one word about being a Scrum Master? And he says, synchronize. I got everything that he said because being a Scrum Master, you have to be able to link everyone together to work together, especially all stakeholders. For example, in Thailand, a Scrum Master, my Scrum Master, he linked his team with HR people and accounting people because he really knew that those people could help him and his team members to deliver uh, outcomes to uh, their customers. That's why you need to be able to uh, synchronize people, link people together. With the ability to synchronize, you don't work alone. You don't work alone in a very powerful team. You are bringing other people uh, within the work system to work with you. You are able to uh, make them collaborate with you, so that you can form a very good, uh, a very good high performance work system. So, uh, so as a conclusion this, to this page, being a true leader, um, we would like you to be compassionate. We like you to be understanding and build a sustainable work environment so that you can continue to deliver the values. We would like you to, to be value driven and result focused, select the right thing to do and, and think about how you can best uh, go about doing it and be able to lead your team to, to the finishing line, deliver the results. Yeah. And you should be able to work with people in your work system, in your organization, to bring them on board so that you don't fight alone, so that the entire organization can move forwards. Ethan, I forgot to say something. Yeah, to synchronize people together, you should have charisma. 
Oh yeah. yes, have charisma, right? To yeah. have charisma, could 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 everyone practice uh, how to have charisma by smile, <laughs> by smiling <laughs> like me now? I really want to see that and <laughs> smile for this right? <laughs> I can't see you guys, but smile for me and have a good night, right? With this, with this, uh, we come to your conclusion for for all the uh, points they want to give you, and uh, this is the end of my section with Dime. Thank you so much. And I want to pass the microphone back to Deepti and the host. Thank you so much. Thanks a lot. And I'm just looking at all the questions which are coming and there are responses from Frank. So, so you know, so first of all, I want to, so there are, wow, there's so many questions. And guys, I want to encourage you to have a look at the questions and answers Q&A. And uh, I see a lot of responses from Frank. So, Frank, if you are there with us still, can you share what is it that you observed in these questions? And if there is any any question you found very impactful or you think will be more beneficial for folks, can you share about that? Yes. So there is there is basically a trend of, of two questions that are very important. And uh, the first type of question that I that I noticed has to do with that people are sort of wondering, can I not do anything different from how Scrum prescribes it? And uh, the, the, the clear cut answer to that is yes, you can. However, I would strongly advise you first try to implement Scrum as it is described because Scrum is derived from thousands and thousands and thousands of teams where we observe which teams are high performing and which teams are lower performing. And from the teams that were high performing, we have deduced which set of, of things that they did that made them so high performing. So when you go and you take those set of, of, of actions of ceremonies and you, you do them well, you will increase velocity by, by a factor of five uh, overnight. So, for instance, with the Daily Scrum, the original uh, setting, as Andrew, uh, as Andrew pointed out, as Jeff was uh, running an organization and they were doing one month, uh, one month sprints, uh, he was sort of looking at like, how can I get this team to be much, much higher performing? And he, he saw the, the article that Andrew mentioned about the Borland uh, Quattro Po teams. And he decided, you know what, we're going to change the way that we are doing Scrum and we're going to introduce this, 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 this daily stand-up. And what we want to do is we want to focus everybody on making sure that, that we get the goal achieved, right? And what happened was that on Monday, they started doing this. And on Thursday, a developer knocked on his door and said, Jeff, and he said, yes. And, he's, and he was like, yeah, we finished it. And, and Jeff was sort of flustered and like, say what now and, and they finished the entire months of work in four days so that sort of gives you an idea of like if you do scrum properly you will become high performing and from my own experience if you become high performing one of the things that you will definitely need to have seen is a product owner that gets completely flustered and goes like oh my god i have to do so much work now <laughs> Right. So if you're there, if you've actually reached that point of high performance and you figure out an experiment to make your team do something differently, that gets you even further along the road. By all means, go do so. If you haven't been there yet, if you haven't had that, oh, my God moment, yeah. then probably you should try to re-examine how Scrum actually is meant and what you're doing wrong, because the key there is not to think that you know better, but to think that you're probably doing it wrong if you have not had that emotion yet. So that's that's a very big set of questions that I saw. The other big set of questions that I saw had to do with uh, the responsibilities versus the and, and accountabilities versus the yes. roles. You won't believe There's lots of people that are about confused that. about yeah. that. Yeah. Yeah. I was yeah, and I think that Aradati actually had a pretty good answer to that. So maybe maybe we can highlight her as, for a second here. <laughs> yeah, I was wanting to ask. So even Aradati, I see throughout I read what happens to the roles, although definitely it was covered in the presentation. But yeah, there is anxiety about it. Will these roles become sort of meaningless, useless? What happens to the conflict of interest? So for example, if an engineering director or engineering manager agrees to play a scrum master role, and then what happens to decision making if there is this one team? Uh, everyone starts imposing, you know, like this panel, if everyone starts speaking, I want to, you know, share, then what happens? So coming back to the responsibility, 
how about rules they had their existence earlier now there is a huge confusion how about conflict of interest if a uh, role within organization more like a manager and all takes up as a scrum master then what happens and last but not the least how decision making can happen sure um yes uh, i can see a lot of questions here around that and you know the way i see it i don't um i don't think there's a um i think good teams were previously already aware that these were not really roles they were accountabilities uh because in scrum there is a lot of emphasis on taking ownership so if you're a product owner you really have to take ownership of your piece of the work and then you also have to work with the team because it's also one team so if you know somebody uh who's a developer on the team is is struggling with their accountabilities then you've got to even help them out cuz ultimately there is just one team so uh so it's a mixture of these two it's you doing your accountabilities but it's also you being part of one team and helping others out if they need that support or help from you and um you know that's where a teams have to understand that now the the ownership is on these particular uh individuals whereas before people thought you know i just have the scrum master title so it doesn't matter what i do um, whether i do my work or not i still have this title um but it, the new scrum guide tries to move us away from that move us more towards these are your accountabilities this is not a given title it's not something you just inherit it's something that you have to earn through delivering on those accountabilities so if you are a scrum master in the team and you worked with the th- team for 3 months 6 months and the team never improved their velocity never went up um your accountability as a scrum master is to improve the effectiveness of the team so if that n- has not happened then you have failed you have failed as a scrum master and you have to acknowledge that and work on improving uh, or seeing where the bottlenecks are or what's causing you to not being able to help the team improve so it's a lot about uh focusing on delivering on our accountabilities and what role you take on doesn't matter so maybe you have some kind of fancy title that you have but ultimately are you delivering on those specific accountabilities so yes and for a lot of um, asian uh, asian uh, a- uh, practitioners if you are hiring a scrum masters a fresh graduate come in here just to schedule your meetings for you and try to think that as a servant leader now the the new scrum guide uh, hopefully after you read it you you will you have a sense that there's no longer uh, the the kind of people we need right we we need a true leader a leader who serves So, to asking further on that question, Ethan, and thanks a lot, Arundhati. Yes, that totally makes sense. So, Ethan, to you. So, are you indicating we should have more experienced, mature folks as scrum masters who can truly be leaders, and not just the MBAs, because that's the trend we are seeing, or you know, just the BAs and BComs uh, uh, with no relevant experience in that particular industry. If I immediately talk about, I'm more talking from a software perspective. So is it not a good practice to have them as a scrum masters because that has started happening they look for cheaper resource and they hire them because they think okay this one just will tell the ceremonies it should be just a csm and that's it what do you think about that so i have an uncle that uh, that runs a cake shop that sells cakes so i know nothing about selling cakes i don't know how to make cakes things like no. that but um um I was trying to ha- have some fun so I said okay I'll come to your shop and help you right so uh once I go into the the shop right I tr- I try to uh, make it work the scrum way and without knowing anything about cake making I, I learned on the fly right yeah. I would I I'm using my own other experience to try to build a scrum a uh, strong team out of it and within a month's time the the revenue grow by 20% and it's amazing for something yeah. that, so what so so i bring in my other experience coming in here so uh so to answer your to answer your question specifically do i absolutely need someone that have the right domain knowledge uh to go go into a team to be a scrum master do i need need to have that sometime but sometime may not be right it depends if you are a product owner for sure that would be really helpful right okay down wants to say something get down yeah i want 
I want to add up something. Please feel that you are a human first. Yeah. And yeah. then you will feel like you want to help other people, even though you have you don't have knowledge. You will find the way to get knowledge to help those people to get what they want. That's true. That's true. And then you know, as you were saying, Dam earlier, you also have to have the charisma. <laughs> That you know, interpersonal skill. Uh, yeah, Frank, you are saying something. Well, I didn't mean to interrupt. Uh, I didn't mean to interrupt. I was gently raising my hand. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, what I think is uh, that that crucially, uh, the role of the scrum master and the role of the product owner are uh, uh, now uh, accountabilities. And the accountability, the central point of these two accountabilities, is that no matter what you're doing. Somebody needs to make sure that you're going at a reasonably high pace and delivering good quality, right? And and it doesn't actually matter what you're doing, but that is the thing that needs to happen, and that is what we call a scrum master. And no matter what you're doing, someone needs to make sure that what you're doing is the right thing, right? It's this 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 dichotomy of doing the right thing and doing the thing right. Right, doing yeah. the right thing is the accountability of the product owner. Doing the thing right is the accountability of the scrum master. Now, does it help for a scrum master to have domain knowledge? In a lot of cases, probably yes. Is it strictly required? Probably no, because as Dom points out, we're all people here, and you work with people, and if you talk with each other, you'll probably figure out the essential things that are needed to make sure that we deliver quality. Right. So, so don't don't alienate yourself. Don't go sit in an iron room. That will probably not get you there. That's also why we say we want you to uh, take on that responsibility as one team, as one group. We're not just individuals here and there. If we fail, we fail together. If we succeed, we succeed together. And we can see this everywhere in the world, right? You can send a bunch of people that don't know each other to a country that is that is a developing country and say, build a hospital. Yeah. And someone might be a CEO, and someone might be I don't know somebody in in a less less high role in an organization. And when they're building a hospital, everybody has the same role and the same goal: get that hospital from the ground, and they get it done. We've seen this time and time and time again. If you have yeah. a goal and you're all responsible for it, and you go for it, you're gonna get there. And then that. That role of making sure that we're doing the thing right and making sure that we're doing the right thing—that's just an accountability. That makes much more sense than having a separate person, necessarily a separate person. So when I so when I went yeah. to the big shop and after reading the uh, Scrum Guide 2020, I make sure that I participate in the entire process. I can't make cake, but I can do the packaging. I can help them with other stuff that I can do, right? So, um, yeah, I, I concur to what what Frank said. Uh, the domain knowledge is not strictly required. You just yeah. have to work your way in and work with the team. Got it. Thank you. And so then there is a very interesting question, and I want Andrew, you know, to share his views about when a scrum master is a developer. Also, what should be the right percentage of their time they need to spend in both the roles? So, Andrew, what do you think about that? Um, so, like I mentioned, you know, like we, we always want everything, and everything means <laughs> like everything is important. I mean, nothing is important, right? Because they are equally important. So, you really have to adjust. You know, you have to ask yourself like which one that is really most more important to you. Me, I made a decision 15 years ago that I no longer want to do development. I moved to, you know, talking to the humans. Um, so that's a decision you have to make. Um, besides, you know, if you read the Scrum Guide, it mentions Scrum Master responsibility is to the team, to the part owner, to the organizations. So you have a lot of things that you need to do. Um, I believe, or correct me if I'm wrong, any trainers here, like in Jeff's, like, you know, the first scrum team, you, he's kind of saying that, you know, you can do 50%. But then later it's like, well, you know, if you want it, that's a lot of things the scrum master has to do. So mm -hmm. I encourage the full-time scrum master. Uh, that's just my point of view. Thanks. Got it. Thank you. And, and so then there is this another question. 
how do you measure the value of product uh, it is decreasing it is staying same or increasing yes and ethan i want to ask you this question what do you think about it how do you measure the value uh, you know of the product development increased staying same or decrease um it's hot it's a very hard question to answer now i personally like to use uh, external numbers external figures to justify the value of our work right so um i remember when i attend dr jeff class like he talked a lot about using the share price uh using those kind of result to to indicate whether a, a product is doing good or not good or team the team's output is good or not good he loved to do that now uh there are people that think that that thought that oh share price is like there's too many other factors affecting it right the idea is that if you uh the best way to to see wh whether we are doing a good job is the end result it, right some result that we can't control internally so you don't measure like oh okay every sprint i can i can have 5000 release things like that i have so many bucks or so many less bucks those are internal numbers so external number first now if you want to use an internal numbers um dr chef advise using uh, process efficiency to do it so do this process efficiency and the uh, external figures you should be able to justify it you should be able to know where you are right so um what i what the tone is let's move away from just doing the work completing mm -hmm. the project finishing my release things like that think about creating some outcome with that release and that's what we really want got it and we can constantly keep on checking as i hear from you with the stakeholders got it thank you and so i before we go on to any next question i want to ensure with my partner here rachel are we allowed to are we within our time boxes and is that okay if we take few more questions <clears throat> correct we hi everyone we can actually take a few more questions and if any of the any of the participants from the floor are interested to speak on the audio just raise your hand yep Thank you. So then there is this question, Frank, and you have already uh, explained, but uh, in the interest uh, uh, of everyone, I just want to ask again, how does it work, you know, when there is this just one product owner and there are multiple teams? Wow, you're going into the one product owner, multiple teams thing here. Okay, that's a slightly bigger than just the Scrum Guide 2020, because that basically uh, goes into Scrum at scale. Um, uh, Scrum at scale is basically uh, how you scale up Scrum uh, in an organization by using networks of networks, which derives from biology in which we have networks of cells that work together to achieve a goal. And um, networks of cells actually then also combine into bigger networks of cells, let's say organs, to achieve an even bigger goal. Now, having a product owner that has a full say on where to go with the product uh, means that you have somebody who can actually give you clear direction, a product goal, which is fantastic. Now, the key question is how would you make sure that all of the teams uh, get their uh, the right work and that they get uh, steered in the right direction? So there's, there's two patterns that we use to solve for this problem. So the first pattern is that we, uh, we, we get many scrum teams because tiny teams perform better, as Jeff said in one of the first videos. So we want many Scrum teams and we want them to work together in a network of networks, which is called a Scrum of Scrums. The Scrum of Scrums is then accountable for delivering the centralized product that the product owner is trying to achieve. And together they try to achieve the product goal, similar to the Google story that, that uh, Arundhati has uh, told us where maybe it was just one. But I also know that you have a story uh, of a YouTube situation where everybody in the entire organization started focusing on the same goal. The other thing that we try to do is we try to make sure that the product owner doesn't stand alone because one product owner for many, many teams actually becomes a little bit of a problem itself. And what we do is we take, we create a, a group of product owners that take their, take their lead from, from the chief product owner and we make the meta scrum. Um, together, uh, that creates a structure by which we have information that can be, that, that can be gotten, which is, usually in the form of a product backlog, and we have delivery responsibility. So now the only thing that we need to do is we, we need to introduce a pull responsibility for teams so that whenever they are ready to do something else, they pull in work. 
right? So you get this network of scrum teams that has a centralized backlog from which they can pull in work. And when work is done, they integrate it back up the chain until they deliver on the product goal. I'd still really like to hear your story on, on YouTube, but Arundhati. I, I see you too, Dom, but I know that story is just so awesome. It, it, <laughs> could you tell that? Dom, do you want to go first so then I can tell, or should I tell my story and then you want to go? Yeah, thank you. I have, I have tips for everyone. Yeah. If you are a product owner, you are a scrum master, whatever you are, if you can take care of many teams, by delivering, by delivering values, and you have time to take care of yourself. You have time to take care of your family members. You have time to eat. You have time to sleep. Take it, but you don't resign because you are dying and your loves are dying too. You have time limitation. Thanks, Dan. There was this question which needed, you know, you, you just replied to that question. So I'll just read the question and I was about to come to you to ask this question. So how many teams does a Scrum Master overlook? And thanks, you you replied the question. So over to you, Arundhati, with that beautiful sure. story of yours. Sure. So the YouTube story is really about, you know, how one time Google figured out that the team at YouTube figured out that a huge number of people who were signing, uh, who were coming to YouTube were actually not signing up. So they would just come, they would view some videos and they would leave. But a lot of the value of YouTube can be unlocked when you actually create an account and then sign in. Um, and for Google, this was really important because they wanted to know who their visitors are and you know they wanted to understand those, those customers better. So they said, okay, so what's one thing we can then focus on to, um, to solve this problem. And they said, okay, let's then keep just one focus of, of getting folks to sign up on YouTube. And they set that one goal, um, the YouTube team and the entire YouTube team set that one goal that our work is to improve um, the number of signups that happen on YouTube. And then that goal got escalated up to uh, to the entire company, Google. And the CEO also adopted that as one of the key goals that they wanted to focus on for the next three months. So when you have that kind of like focus, the entire company is trying to see what happens, like how much uh, increase they can do for their signups. That, that kind of a laser focus um, then means like all hands on board. We've got to get this one right. Um, and you can then, you know, that was, of course, that was the goal, but then where there were lots of different teams working on it. It wasn't just one team, but there were like lots of product owners, lots of different teams working on that, but they were all working towards that one goal. And sure enough, in three months, they, they saw radical, radical improvement in their signups. So. Yeah, Arundhati, I love your story. Um, it's, it's about the outcome it's not about making a release and it's not about making a version of software it's not about finishing uh whatever whatever work right great definitely so there is this another question which says when we have a common product backlog for three teams who can pull stories from there who are the participants of backlog refinement all the three teams or all teams will have a separate backlog refinement after selecting stories. So Ethan, if you can help us with the response to this. Um, I, 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 I think I, I, I speak too much, so I'll let other people. <laughs> <laughs> I keep on jumping in. Sorry, guys. I think this is a Scrum at scale question. So, Frank, you want to tell us more? <laughs> well, well, oh, sorry. I just saw like a giant, uh, giant comment by Toralf, who is also a Scrum and Skill uh, trainer. So I was like, ooh, interesting. Yeah, it's hiding <laughs> in the audience, list, right? <laughs> um, but uh, I think uh, what you need to keep in mind here is that you want to have all teams have the ability to be able to pull in the work. And in order to be able to pull in the work, uh, you can actually go back to a basic principle of why you would do a refinement at all. And a reason to do a refinement is to create a work breakdown. And uh, that can be sort of explained as, uh, if the developers have broken down the work to a degree where they can understand how they will be doing the work, 
then that means that when they actually start doing the work, they can have good focus on it and they know what's going, going to happen. They know which dependencies they might or might not encounter. And what you would want to have is have the work that is ready to be pulled in, uh, be in that state. So either you have a really good description that is the output of a decentralized meeting, or you have the team that wants to start pulling in the work, uh, do some pre-work and actually do the work breakdown. And the way you actually achieve it isn't necessarily as important as the fact that you do achieve the work breakdown. Right. Well, thank you very much. So then there is this question which says, ha, ah, it says, now looking at everyone can you know share the responsibility. It is all about responsibility and accountability. So don't we need to hire full-time scrum masters? You know what, with this guide, I can clearly see a fear about this scrum master role because now organizations got you know the leverage uh, to say, okay, we don't need scrum master, or a developer can we do it on and also on the rotation basis. First week you will be scrum master, second week you will be scrum master, and third week, you know, somebody else probably will make that lead to be the scrum master. So what is your response to that? Don't organization need to hire full-time scrum masters now? I can add a little bit to it and then somebody else can continue. Um, I would say if we go back to the accountabilities, it is, um, you know, if we're talking about Scrum Master, Scrum Master is somebody who helps the team improve, become effective. Really good Scrum Masters will help a team increase productivity and we'll see a velocity increases of 400% and 800% or more. And I have seen this happen in teams. And Andrew shared a story around how that happened in his team. So we know that good scrum can great, get tremendous productivity increases in teams. So the, the point then is that you need a scrum master who can help you get there. Um, if you are a two person team, maybe you that Scrum Master is also part of the team. They're also coding. Dr. Sutherland gave us that example. They were like a two-person startup and both of them were coding. One was a Scrum Master, one was a product owner. So um, maybe that's possible. And I've seen four-person teams where the Scrum Master is also one of the developer uh, members. Like they're doing the work, but also they are the Scrum Master. And that works perfectly in a small team, maybe a four. Um, so it really depends on your situation. But the Scrum Master has to help the team become really high hyper productive and if that's not happening then you uh, the scrub master uh, is not able to do their job so whether they need to be full-time or part-time or however it is they can do the work doesn't matter over to you frank i, I saw you raise your hand yeah well I, I i i want to chime in a little bit right i've been in a in a really high performing team and in that team i was uh, the i was a developer and uh, we we got to a, a ridiculous high performance we outperformed some of the teams around us by a factor of 100 which is well within the boundaries of what is possible because the least possible teams are outperformed by the highest performing teams by a factor of 2098 right so 100 is doable um, a very interesting thing that I've seen in organizations is that they hire scrum masters and then, then following up on that, uh, the teams actually do not increase in performance. Uh, what I would actually add on top of what you were saying is what you should do, it should look, you should look at uh, is the performance increasing and is it, is it hitting the mark? And if you want to know how, how to measure if, if a team is hitting the mark, you should really look into process efficiency. Having a process efficiency of 25% or better is definitely hitting the mark. Now, if you're not hitting the mark and you're not increasing speed, you will need to do something about it. But more importantly, if you have people that should have been doing something about it and they're not, you should fire those people. So instead of saying you should hire or not hire full-time scrum masters to do stuff, I would say you should fire all of the scrum masters that aren't doing stuff. I don't know if you disagree with that strongly, but that's definitely how I feel because not, uh, not getting the results, but having the people there, that's basically just wasting money. I think Andrew was first. Yeah, I, I agree with what Frank said. And then as a Scrum Master, I was a Scrum Master before. So you have to grow yourself, right? You, you become, you're a Scrum Master and you become a trainer, you become a coach and you learn different skills. And not only helping your team, you help other teams. So when I was a scrum master, I helped another enterprise team. Um, 
and they were using Kanban before, but they use, then later they're using Scrum. So there are other, a lot of opportunity you can grow yourself. And then, you know, you have to prove that you provide value to the team, to the organizations. Thanks. So I'd like to add to this. Um, um, Jeff, uh, Dr. Sutherland knows me as someone that asked very tough question to him. And, uh, and that was this time, uh, that was this time last year when I was I, at uh, Scrum in Japan. That was the time when I know Cascade. So I asked Jeff this question. I, I said, Jeff, you talk about Scrum being, uh, making a team more efficient, right? Lower cost, more revenue. Jeff, then why are you inserting a new headcount into the, the, the team by the name of a Scrum master? Aren't you supposed to just lower the cost? Why, why having a new headcount into, into, into the team? Jeff answered to me like this. He said, that was never my intention. The first Scrum team, um, I have a team leader. I didn't know what to call him. And I don't want him to be a very commanding leader. So uh, I call him the Scrum Master. And it has always been my model of the Scrum Master that he's in the team, he's a leader, be it the team leader or what, right? He is a leader and he's already in the team to do the works. So with me, like with Jeff, uh, has never been a new headcount introducing into the system, but find a leader in your team, make him the Scrum Master and work with you. Right. And that's that's what I would do from the first scrum team to 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 now. That's what Jeff said. And then further ask him now, do you think a, a full time scrum master is necessary? And the, the official answer he gave me is that, well, I think it could work in some environment. Uh, when I look at some of the largest projects in 3M and GE, now due to the complexity of the environment, um, I think that the full time scrum master will work there. So notice this line, it could work for a full-time Scrum Master. And that's how he answered me. So I hope the audiences will take this as an, as an answer that a Scrum Master should not be a, a new headcount into the system. It should not be a full-time administrative, a secretarial role to help you schedule your meetings. It should be a leader that work with you day to day, win or lose with you. That is the person, that's the Scrum Master. Didi. Thank you. Uh, and this is very tricky. Hi, hi DT. Hi, Thank guys. You. Just to interrupt, there's actually an audience over here by the name of Pradesh uh, who would like to speak to the panelists. So, can uh -huh. we allow? Okay. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Pradesh, sure. get ready. I'm going to allow you to talk. Welcome, Pradesh. Hi, Pradesh. Uh, hi everyone. This is Pradesh here. Am I audible clearly? Yes. yes. Hi. Yeah. Hi. All right. Okay. So I'm basically from uh, Malaysia, but I am an Indian. Okay. So uh, my question actually partially Arundhati already answered to that. Okay. So it's again comes back to the sharing of the responsibility of the scrum master uh, uh, that can be taken by any other uh, 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 other member from the uh, scrum team. Okay. So uh, I already posted this question and I got some answer from Frank as well. But I would like to know what are others' opinion uh, on this. Basically, uh, see, uh, when I took my CSM uh, course, so one of the role, uh, one of the major uh, thing that the Scrum Master uh, role is uh, to be unbiased and uh, to maintain uh, that uh, conflict of interest. Okay. So... Now, uh, so for example, if a technical lead or someone is taking the role of a scrum master and then uh, any issue comes, uh, for example, a bug comes uh, while building an application or anything. So obviously, uh, in an idealistic world, they will uh, think about achieving the goal, whether we are performing in a good way or not. But uh, it... Uh, I mean, in a realistic world, it happens that the tech lead will always, uh, I mean, favor the favor his tech team. Okay. So, and also uh, to continue with this question, uh, see when a uh, when a team actually evolves as a good team, uh, well, uh, perf uh, performing uh, in a brilliant way, uh, the scrum master can actually go forward to take uh, the role uh, with two or three projects. Okay. 
so is that out of the picture now or what are your thoughts on these things yep uh, that's it from my side thanks go for it frank go for it frank is your right <laughs> Oh, well, we we have this nice rule that you raise your hand. <laughs> so, um, uh, Pratish, thanks for your question and thanks for the for the deep dive into into all of this. Um, I think there's a couple of things that are going to be your big friend here, and uh, one of the first ones is that uh, if we're a single team and we have a single shared responsibility. um that means that uh, the uh, the objectives of the goal should be uh, uh, less important sorry the, the objectives of any individual should be less important than the shared objective of the team right that that defines what is what is how a team is different from a group of individuals so if you are going to be a team you're going to have to make a deal together this is what we're going to strive towards that is the product goal no matter what everybody else will say the product goal is the centralized thing that we're all going for and no matter what anybody's particular opinion is striving towards the goal and achieving the goal must be everybody's number one priority right so so that helps helps eradicate a lot of problems right i've i've had to had to set aside my own opinion from time to time as well uh, when it it really uh, blocks us from achieving the product goal. So so that is really a, a really important ingredient that helps us out uh, helps us out there. A second thing is is a very very humane uh, very humane thing uh, as well. If you're going to be uh, taking on many different hats and many different roles and responsibilities, the question is not could you or should you do that? The question is what is the impact of you doing that on your performance? right the, the chances are is that if you're going to be increasing in performance the more high performing you get the more work you have to make sure that you keep on having the high performance and the high quality now that means to me that if you're not being very high performant and this is also a thing that i'm experiencing in different types of roles that i've been into as well and if you're not being that high performant you don't have that much work yet so to me growing from a team that is not very high performant into a team that is much more high performant means that there's much more stuff going on and there's much more stuff you need to do to make sure that we keep on having that laser sharp for focus on performance and quality now i think that focus requires a lot of attention um but maybe somebody else disagrees right but i know yeah somebody else might disagree <laughs> yeah so yeah i think those were some you know painful questions which were constantly there there was this one interesting question which i was you know just thinking around and uh, uh what we haven't spoken anything about agile coach and uh, what is there anything that scrum guide talks about as agile coach what do you think and i want anyone to hear frank please Well there's this this nice video clip where Jeff actually explains how he was trying to do a, a scrum implementation at Intel I believe it was and uh, they had just done an agile implementation and it had drastically failed uh, and so the senior management now said that the word scrum was basically forbidden and not necessarily because scrum was forbidden or the objectives that were trying to achieve by getting scrum was forbidden it was just that you know that's a no no word now And so what Jeff did was he basically took the concept of what a scrum master should be doing and he said well we'll we'll call them agile coaches then. So you know yeah, yeah. what's in the name? So so, so it's what <laughs> as well, right? So so, so is there any idea of senior scrum master or so? <laughs> can I add can I add something please? Absolutely. Yeah, just be a human, <laughs> and you you will understand. It just come out of nowhere, Dave. <laughs> you, you will understand how to work together. You will understand how to help and support other people. Just be a human, and if you can realize this, yeah, all answers are there. That's true, and and you know. uh when you can't do something for example when i'm not very much patient i only always call myself i'm a consultant i'm not a coach <laughs> and behind that layer i hide all my incompetency of being empathetic or patient 
Yeah. I think nowadays uh, everybody call themselves an agile coach. I, I like last two weeks I met an agile coach that's like fresh graduate, about two two months of uh, work experience. So he started his his work career as an agile coach. And these are yeah. some of the, the things that I've seen that I, I don't I, I would not have believed. But the, the word is agile coach ramp is very rampant now. Everybody yeah. called them an agile coach. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah so, you, so you just setting, to add to that. Yeah, yeah. No, I was just saying, saying setting a LinkedIn title which says I'm an enterprise agile coach. So yeah. So yeah, I mean titles mean nothing. Um I've seen, so in some companies, it is the, you know, there might be scrum masters for different teams, and then you <laughs> might have an agile coach that helps all these different teams, like somebody who's lot, uh, who has a lot of experience, and maybe they can give some guidance or advice to the scrum masters when they need it. So I've certainly seen agile coaches play that kind of role. Um, but we've also seen people just take, you know, interchangeably use those titles. And I personally think that titles mean nothing. Like, are you doing those things that you're accountable for? And if you can help a team or a number of teams get to extreme high performance, it doesn't matter what you call yourself. Um, just get to that place. Just take your team to that place. And I know we know from data and uh, from thousands of companies that folks who do good scrum can get to extreme high performance. So I think we should keep that focus. And then the titles are not really relevant. It doesn't matter what you call yourself. Arundhati, I think next time we should call ourselves old age of coach. <laughs> so we'll call ourselves the humans, old just like Dom says, oh, right? Oh, yeah. By the way, Dom, I just love the exercise you made us all do. So can you please make us all do that exercise again? I loved it. Yeah. Actually, you know what? It's not, mm -hmm. it's not fun to laugh on people who are calling themselves Agile Coach. I think no one... Can you remember the first day that you can, you can drive? Yes. still remember that so i think if we think we are better than anyone else or we have more knowledge than anyone else support them and they will yes. have then they will help other people to have better lives that's our that's beautiful. ability that's beautiful Dan. absolutely yes and i'm and I, i'm with you on that but Dan, you can't deny the request you have to please make us do that exercise and trust me, I was really taken aback. I was such a surprise. I was like, okay, he's asking something seriously. And I did steps. So now you have to tell us those steps again. And we're all going to do that together. Dan, that was to you. Yeah. Sorry. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sleepy. Hey, I just did the exercise. So, you know, I I'm just sleepy. spoiled it. You know? <laughs> I spoiled the surprise and nobody. So, so the conversation is from where we were all very serious and heated up on what is right and what is needed to be done. And Dan said, let's take a break. Let's do an exercise. And what was the exercise? He said, separate your lips and produce this sound of ha ha ha. <laughs> that, yeah. That's that's got to how we remember Dan for. Yeah, yeah. And yes, you have great human values. That's what we love. Now, how much of that value do you see in Scrum Masters these days? Now forget the ideal scenario. And you have met you know, you know have you have met so many people in your journey. And so uh, the qualities that you appreciate in people, you know, the core values, being human. How much have you seen in your colleagues? How much have you seen, uh, you know, for the companies you have worked with? What is your take on that? For that, um, you know what? After after this session, I'm not even, I'm, I don't, I'm not even sure Go, after going to bed tomorrow, tomorrow, I'm not even sure if, I will wake up tomorrow. Yeah, I don't, I don't really know. So anytime when I meet people wh whom I really know or people I don't really know, yeah, just be there. Yeah, spend, spend time and create happiness. Um, you don't get to win all hearts, no. <laughs> <laughs> That's beautiful. That's really touching. 
and yeah, yeah but guys we uh, he's he's taken we were all the love you look at the chats and you look at all the queer q and a so but thank you dam that's beautiful and so now we are just remaining with 2 minutes and rachel at any point in time can kick me out saying the time box is <laughs> up i have one you know question which is tricky and that's more of a scenario now this gentleman or lady is asking that we have a a uh, scrum master who is actually a tech lead kind of role or a you know architect kind of role and uh, uh, the problem is there are no good qualities as scrum masters in there and uh, people are you know uh, uh, not in a position to express uh, what should be done you know with that kind of scrum master because now there is no qualified scrum master there is a role which is just taken up by the organization and uh, assigned to someone who is in the position of authority please frank so the solution to this is actually fairly simple right if the if the organization is striving to achieve a goal and the organization has value then the the hierarchy should represent competence right if you have people that are competent at achieving value once again exactly as arundhati say the title awesome. of what they're doing does not matter awesome. but if you awesome. have no people that are doing that a good leader different from a bad leader will recognize that and will say we need help getting better we need to find information people or new practices to 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 do to achieve the goal that we're all striving to achieve it's when you have the central goal uh where everybody is striving towards that irons out all of the the, the the differences and the 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 problems that people have with each other as long as you fail to have such a goal you will always be ridden with these kinds of problems so yeah. centralized to the solution i would say find a central goal to work towards as a greater overarching organization dom okay. yes do you know this book joy inc Jane. Yeah, I really like recruitment systems from uh, this company. If this company wants to hire someone, uh, the company asks that person to work one day, and then ask what ask only one question: Do you still want to work with this team? And then ask the team: Do you want to still work with this person? If uh, that situation got to yeses, yeah, that uh, candidate uh, would work one more week, and they got the same questions. Yeah, if uh, got if they got to yeses again and then that candidate uh, would work one more month yeah, yeah. i really like this uh, recruitment system here yeah and yes yeah. and it's from uh, menlo innovations thanks yeah. for sharing that dom and you can actually go look up menlo innovations uh, i believe they're in michigan in the united states uh, they're a wonderful company and very innovative and they actually do free virtual tours to show you how they work and they work in a very very collaborative and fun way so um yeah i think yeah. they really embody uh the essence of scrum yeah i, I also see that that sharing. tom is actually with us and yeah. uh, he is from manlo so we yeah go together awesome I, i wrote to richard and he said welcome <laughs> <laughs> i did Great a virtual tour with here. manlo and i loved it big sharing over here but unfortunately guys i think We are about to end this session really soon. We don't want to keep the audience like awake for too late at night. So thank you all the panelists for your great insights, the audience for the great questions over here. So now it's the end and we have to part now. But if you would like to receive the recording for this event, you may follow us uh, in the links that I've shared in the chat section. So we will be posting the recording of this session on our YouTube channel. and then we'll be sharing great events that's upcoming in our social platforms so stay tuned and follow us yeah thank you thank you yep. so much thank you. you so much guys thanks good everyone night. have a good rest thank everyone and thanks everyone. for being here yeah. bye. Bye, bye everyone good night everyone bye bye everyone thanks bye bye bye